My guest today is Jess Borland. Jess, how are you? I'm doing great, David. Great to see you again. It's great to have you back on my show. Thank you for what, having uh, me. I heard you were at Pass Summit today. I was. Tell me um, about that. So for those of you that don't know, Pass Summit is the biggest SQL server and data conference in the world. Yeah, it's and like 2,500 people? Like uh, yeah, it's gotten up to close to 5,000 now, Oh my gosh, actually. I was way underestimating. It's growing significantly. Um, and it used to be very focused on SQL Server, expanded more to cover analytics, Azure, and many other topics. Um, and so it's great to see the community growing. It's great to see the topics growing. And I was even speaking on what did you speak a about? new topic for me. Tell me. Um, so I talked about roles and responsibilities of the Azure data engineer. Okay. So earlier this year, Microsoft uh, released some new certifications around tools and services and platforms in Azure. One of those is very analytics based and two of the exams make an Azure Data Engineer Associate certification. So they hmm. are uh, implementing a data engineering solution and designing a data engineering solution. Hmm. Okay. That seems like you have those backwards, but uh, <laughs> you could design it first and implement it. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but those are the, the titles of yep. the two exams. And that's, so that's what you talked about is the skills that go into not only passing the exam, but actually implementing and designing databases. Yeah, so I covered, um, started at a very high level with what is data engineering? It seems that most people, if you mention you know, what a data scientist is, they have this um, image in their mind of someone who writes algorithms, does a lot of testing, knows Python, knows R, works with data. Okay. But that's, that's sometimes that's true. Yes, and uh, there's this whole um, discipline that comes with getting data ready for data scientists and analysts to work with the data engineering that goes into it. Okay, so that's what data engineering is. It's preparing data so that it can be used in a useful way to yeah. to, to, to do some real work. Yes, right. yes, and it's it's the sometimes the data scientists do it. A lot of times they participate in it. Sometimes mm -hmm. there's data engineers that do that. It, just depends on the size of the team, the size of the company, the scale of the project. Okay. Um, but in, in my mind, um, and what I was trying to emphasize is I really feel there's like five um, disciplines within this field getting the data ready for analysis and modeling um, that the data engineers do. And those are things like being able to build the infrastructure, particularly infrastructure as code. Okay. Um, so when we say infrastructure, what are you talking about exactly? Uh, it's building the compute and storage systems that okay. underlie the data. All right, um, so that might be a SQL Server, a physical SQL Server. It, it might, might be something be. in the cloud. It might be something in the cloud. It might be a distributed system like HDFS. Okay. So there's a range of different choices. Okay. Just understanding what the choices are. Uh -huh. And again, um, infrastructure as code is a big you know, buzzword and term lately, and that's important too. Mm -hmm. Um, the second pillar is um, identifying different disparate data sources and knowing how to ingest them. You know, mm. There's such a range of types of data these days. No, yeah, uh, relational, non-relational. Relational, non-relational. Yeah, IoT devices generate data. Just And so data engineers need to really be familiar with just the variety and volume of data that's available to them. Oh, I, I mentioned uh, I went right straight to the data stores. <laughs> You're talking about there's, there's sources of data as well. Correct, like correct. Like just starting with the different Some sources of, stuff never of data. Gets stored, just gets processed. And yes. This process stuff gets stored. <laughs> yeah, so being able to um, identify the different data that's available and know how to work with it is important. Mm -hmm. um, a third pillar that I talk about is the um, building of data pipelines and uh, just pipelines to, once you've identified that data, bring it into what your destination is going to be. So you mentioned the data store, which is the important part and where it's going to end up. Mm -hmm. We have to have a process to get it from where it's being generated from uh -huh. the source to where it's being stored. Right, and then you get it in the right format to store it. Okay. Correct. Um, the next pillar is going to be uh, data modeling. What will that data look like in its final form? Mm -hmm. You know, are we still doing um, star schema? Are we doing snowflake? Is it going to be even in a structured data warehouse, or is it going to be in something less structured, like a um, data lake? 
right? Mm. And so um, data modeling tools are very important. Um, and then the last pillar, data modeling tools such as, or I should say, data modeling processes okay. are more important. I I try to stay away from diving too deeply into individual tools when talking about just the discipline as it's okay, on its enough. own, as there's so many tools yeah. out there. <laughs> right. um, and then the last pillar that I like to talk about is um, building the data storage, right? Because in the end, we need to make sure that our data is stored in the correct way. Yeah. It's um, available, highly available, resilient, not corrupted. So right. those are some key very high level, not technology specific yeah. concepts that I think data engineers need to, or the people that are preparing the data for analysis and data science, algorithms, machine learning, AI, really need to be familiar with and um, comfortable with. And then we can start talking about, okay, what is a specific implementation of that? Hmm. And my specific implementation of that was the Microsoft Azure tools right. for data engineering. <laughs> Great. We're in a Microsoft event. Yes. <laughs> um, I've got my Microsoft shirt okay. on even for speaking. Um, and so in Azure, there's a large variety of tools, um, platform as a service tools, um, even infrastructure as a service tools that can meet those needs. Yeah, uh, every piece of it. There's storage, there's uh, uh, processing uh, services, and just routing services, all sorts of things. Exactly, exactly. So I like to talk about, you know, we talk about um, that first one, which is identifying all those disparate data sources and ingesting them. You know, you have tools like Event Hubs and Stream mm -hmm. Analytics and Azure Data Factory to help you with that. Uh, we talk then about where we're, how we're going to cleanse the data as well, right? ETL and ELT, mm -hmm. and we have and tools. ETL is ETL is extract, transform, and load. Okay. So a step from taking the data from a source, extracting, <laughs> uh, transforming it. So doing things like making sure that we have all the correct data types, perhaps merging two data sources okay. together, um, performing any. Um, additional transformations to shorten data up, clean it, make sure it's yeah. make sure you have valid dates when you have date columns, that sort of thing, and then you load it into your source database okay. or your destination. ELT. So, e uh, ELT is a newer method that's um, becoming more popular when dealing with large, big data data sets. In that construct, we extract the data from the source and we just load it into our data uh, destination. Like a data lake, for example. A data lake is the primary recipient of that data. And then the transformations that happen um, are done primarily by the analyst or the data scientist. Okay. Um, ETL, so the more traditional method, is really designed when we design for when the person that's asking the question of the data knows what questions they want to ask. ELT, extract, load, and transform, is when we have a more wider ranging set of data and we don't know exactly what questions we want to ask. So they want the raw data in the format that it was generated in and then they can continue to cleanse it, transform it, right. um, and do different things with it. Right. They, may do, they may send it to multiple systems or they may change their mind. And say, yeah. you know, Let's restart. We yes. Need to data in its original format. Let's yes. Um, I talked a little bit about the different types of storage options, and it is things like, um, you know, we have multiple relational data stores in Azure, um, SQL Server, MySQL now, Postgres. We also have Cosmos DB, which offers a variety. Yep, distributed document database. Yeah, and then we also have the data stores like just blob storage, still highly used because well, it's just everybody. It's easy and it's cheap. Easy and cheap, and you can store just about anything in it. And data lake, as you mentioned, when you have you know, slightly more structured and hierarchical data, HDFS style data. Mm -hmm. um, the real kicker though is getting to um, that analysis piece and so I talked a little bit about one of the Azure premier tools for data analysts, data 
um, scientists and even data engineers, which is Databricks. <laughs> so Databricks is um, a wraparound Apache Spark, right. which is the in-memory database, allows for really fast computations to mm -hmm. be performed on large amounts of data, which is exactly what data engineers are working with and what data scientists more want more to do. Every year, yeah. Yeah. And, um, so I like to talk about you know, Databricks really becoming an emerging technology, really becoming one of our keystone pieces in the data engineering and data science toolkit in Azure. Um, and one of the things that I like to tell people is if you're interested in that, if you don't already know Python, let's learn Python. It's a good tool to have, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great language. There's um, so much of data engineering, data science, and just data work in general now is becoming a lot more... Um, flexible with Python and a lot yeah, more driven. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, libraries that are already pre-built to do things like uh, visualization and uh, slicing and dicing. Analysis, mathematics. Data, a lot of math libraries, things like that. Yes. It's, so. got, a, it's got a rich ecosystem around it. It does, The language yes. itself is actually pretty small. <laughs> yes. So, so yeah, that was my session. I talked uh, about the data engineering discipline at a high level and then those tools and services in Azure that tie directly to it and you know the the real crux of it is no company has less data than they did a year ago right. and no company wants to say we're just going to continue to ask reactive questions about how did we do last year how did we do last month what was our failure rate on this device companies want to look at the data they have and start asking questions like based on what we have in the past, can we predict what will happen in the it's future? Much it's much more valuable at predictive analytics. And so the discipline of data engineering helps a company hmm. start getting to that point. Did you have a good crowd for this session? I had a great crowd for this session. Almost 100 people were That's there. Impressive. And a great enthusiastic crowd asked some great questions, which I always like getting. Why do you think there's so much enthusiasm for this topic? I think that a lot of People that are working with data today um, see that thing that I just mentioned, which is their companies now no longer want to just know what happened in the uh, past. They want to see what happened in the future. So they know this question, but they, they haven't figured out the answer yet. They're coming to you. Correct. To They're, your session. <laughs> yes. <laughs> kickstart on that answer. Exactly. They want to be the person that uh, at the company that says, I can help us get that answer. I can help us. Um, also, more people are getting uh, more companies are starting to move to Azure. It's, you know, almost every company has an investment in one or more cloud systems. Yeah, it's sense. even if it's not 100% in a cloud system, companies have bits and pieces, certain applications, certain processes. And so a certification in Azure data engineering um, becomes more valuable because then you can show that you have the skills to use those cloud tools, which customers which and companies are using yeah i uh i have mixed feelings on certification i think they're as they, do they i value. <laughs> they're, they're, they're nice they show a, a level of competence and they also help you to study they help you to learn it's a really big value that i always get out of that. yes uh, and, uh, but then i don't want to go too far they, they're, hmm. there are limitations too. yes they're not just just the passing a certification really what you're after the experience Yes, exactly. And yeah, I, so I took these certification exams back uh, in, uh, I passed both of them by June of this year. Thank you. And that's, um, it was kind of a big deal for me because they, a year ago, right? So November of 2018, um, in terms of data engineering, I knew a few of the pieces, but I wasn't familiar that's with just, things yeah, like. That's what studying with the exams. Yeah, to, so uh, grasp these concepts. it did. And like, I'm a very, very data heavy person in terms of the relational data stores and the data transformations. But things like streaming data, IoT data, data lakes, um, those were new concepts to me. So by, by going through the certification process myself, I learned a ton. It was a really valuable experience for me. Excellent. I, now, I know you're in, uh, you were a former MVP and I then you joined that. Microsoft. You used to speak a lot. And yeah, you're still speaking. I do. Are you still doing a lot of speaking? I am, What's yes. It's uh, one of my, one of the things that I love most is being I, able to speak. I do too. I wish I had more time. Exactly, exactly. Um, I have a code camp in Milwaukee coming okay. up. Um, I'll that, have... Which, which one is that? There's a couple of them there. 
at Milwaukee Code Camp. Okay, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, there's two. There remember. is. They just had M-K-E one. M-K-E something. Yes, and that one was the one that already passed. This okay. is the smaller one. There's also a Code Camp coming up in Appleton, Wisconsin in December. Okay. But um, for next year, Who I... want to go to northern Wisconsin exactly. in December? <laughs> in December, much less. <laughs> um, for 20... 2020, it's hard to believe I'm saying 2020 already. Um, selection hasn't gone out, but I'm hoping to get to a couple sequel Saturdays. Uh-huh. In I've been to one organized by you in Madison. Yes, Madison, uh, Chicago. <laughs> I'm hoping to maybe get somewhere warmer, maybe Florida <laughs> this year. Florida would be great. Um, and there's also a great... Maui would be great. Is no, there one there? <laughs> not yet. They actually did have one sequel Saturday Hawaii many years ago. Okay. That was it. Um I've also submitted to speak at uh, the SQL Bits Conference, which oh, is um, a s- data-focused conference okay. over in England. Oh, how exciting. All community-driven. I went there for the first time this year, uh-huh. and it was an amazing experience. Uh, again, not put on by a specific vendor. Right. Um, entirely community-driven. Those so are the ones I like best. All of the sessions are very carefully curated. Their attention to details for the attendees is fantastic. And then the last night of the conference, they have this wonderful party, which is always themed. And people show up in costumes and get to play games and bring their families in England. Yeah, it's a great experience. So I'm hoping I hoping I get to go back to that one this year. And um, just looking for some new opportunities, too. I continue to say that um, one of my favorite things to do as a data person is go to developer code camps because Mm. every developer works with data um, and being able to take these complex concepts about data and explain it in simple terms that helps them work with it better and make their applications more efficient and their databases more efficient is what I like to do. Thank you you so much. Thanks for having me, David. One of the things that I like best about learning a new technology is that I can share that knowledge and make new friends.